Welcome to DeFi by Design, where we talk all things blockchain and cryptocurrency while striving to educate, empower, and enrich. What's up, guys? Just want to take a quick break and tell you about our sponsors for DeFi Slate. So first, we have Acropolis. Acropolis is an all-in-one DeFi yield farming platform. They actually offer dollar cost averaging into Bitcoin and Ethereum uncollateralized loans. And their mainnet just launched. It's called Delphi, and they actually just filled it up to a cap, and they have governance launching soon. Check out Acropolis.io for more. And then we have MCDEX. MCDEX is the first decentralized perpetual swap exchange. They offer up to 10x on Ethereum perpetual swaps and 5x on Link, as well as Lend and SNX, completely decentralized trading. Check them out on MCDEX. Io. Both these platforms are extremely active in the DeFi space and their protocols are growing and the users are as well. So check those out and we'll get right back to the podcast now. What's going on, everybody? We are here with Matthew from loopring.org. Loopring is a revolutionary decentralized exchange in the Ethereum ecosystem at this time. We will explain why, what's to come, and what it's all about here very, very shortly. Rob, how you doing today? I'm excited. I'm excited to learn a lot more about the difference between Plasma and ZK Rollup specifically, because you know, as far as my limited understanding of smart contracts and Ethereum scaling, that that's really been kind of the decision: is how to scale. Is it using you know the this one aspect of scaling or or this other one? I think we're going to learn a lot from Matt here because I really don't know uh, the difference about you know each one of them specifically. Pretty much, just we're going to have sharding on Ethereum. Uh, I think that might be kind of the, the knowledge level of, of a lot of our audience. So I'm really interested in learning that difference in how we're actually going to achieve cheaper gas fees and what are some of the uh, implementations that are already in place that are solving this. Awesome. Tight. Well, thank you for having me, guys. We'll cover all that, I hope. Yeah. So Matt, a brief touch on your background. How did you uh, get to Loopering? Kind of what's your interest levels all around up to this point? Real quick, just so quick um i come from a finance background i was doing a bunch of finance e stuff i was a cfa or i guess i still am i was trading bonds and then i found yeah found crypto i was just like intellectually curious poking around and then i left the the fixed income shop and uh just no real plan at that time it was just like learning i was actually writing for a centralized exchange here in canada and then i found loop ring very early, like right after they launched, I guess. And I was kind of just a, a big fan and would correspond with the team a lot. And uh, very early on, I just joined and that was like two and a half years ago or a bit more maybe. And yeah, so now I lead uh, like the business side of Loopering because we're mostly a team of engineers. Everyone is much smarter than myself, mostly based in Shanghai, doing the important stuff. And yeah, I, I try to help with everything else. So you left the suit world for the degen world, huh? <laughs> Definitely. Like I used to think I was kind of crazy. Well, it wasn't like a degen world back then, to be fair, it was like no world or just like weird, but uh, yeah, I did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Nice. And what's kind of your day to day over at Loopring, like versus uh, maybe the guys over in Shanghai? that are doing the important stuff, as you say. Yeah, well, stuff like this, kind of a funny day. I, I, was, I was telling Andy before I did like another little uh, chat um, just be, before uh, on another. So I never, it's really like a back-to-back -back style day, but today is one of those. But being like this, that was just, you know, building relationships. And uh, now that we have, I mean, for the longest time, we didn't have like users, users. We were just a protocol. I guess we'll get into all that, but now we have like a product atop the protocol, right? That we operate. So dealing with just everyday users that say, Hey, why is this transaction stuff? But yeah, just dealing with, um, I guess a lot of, you know, I don't want to say like partnerships. It's not really like that anymore, but just, you know, work, you need to know what's going on in the space and people that want to, you know, use layer two, these, you just need to be there and be known. And you know what I mean? It's uh, it's quite intangible, but just um, it's really it's it's 24/7. Uh, Monday is no different than than Sunday. Probably similar to you guys, and um, especially with the team in Shanghai, 2 p.m. is no different than 2 a.m. for me. So it's just uh, it's just grow, 
loop ring. <laughs> yeah. And the Discord chats and Telegram, that they, they never end. Yeah. And that's a great segue. Um, yeah, that I just think that's a great segue into because I only know about Loopring, the decentralized exchange, and I haven't used it too much. But just the most attractive and the most appealing thing is obviously the gas fees, right? They're they're just exploding right now. What could you explain the difference between the protocol protocol and uh, the product and and how that evolved? Yeah. So um, yeah, since three years ago when we started, we were like we were a Dex protocol. Uh, back then, smart contracts allowed other people to build decentralized exchanges. Back then, it was kind of just um, like an earlier model, just like everything was on chain, or not exactly. It was kind of like the zero X model, where order books could be off chain, and then you match them and you submit them to Ethereum for settlement. So kind of the hybrid, not like the all on chain model, but like the next step. Um, and yeah, so that's what we were building. And so we've always been Dex protocol people. A year and a half ago, we dove deep into scalability, specifically ZK rollups as, as a flavor of scalability. So we became a scalable DEX protocol. Uh, that like culminated in December 2019, we deployed version three, uh, version three of Loopring, which was the ZK rollup version. So that was the first ZK rollup on Ethereum. I don't mean to say this word so much since we haven't described it, but yeah, that was the first ZK rollup live on Ethereum. And it was just like kind of sitting there. There was like a team building on it um, in China not, not our team, a different team. And then we, a few months later, like in February, released our own DEX, like our own venue atop of the protocol. The protocol is just a bunch of rules about how this thing should work, how trades should be signed and matched. And in our case, there's a bunch of smart contracts on chain, like the old way that's based in Ethereum. But the ZK world means there's a bunch of off-chain stuff. Tree, we have to prove in, you know, these, these ZK snarks. So there's a whole, so that, yeah, so the, the protocol is a bunch of smart contracts and a bunch of zero knowledge circuits, but we went up the stack and built our own venue, loopring.io, where people could, try. it's pretty cool, especially for me, you know, on the, on the business side, it gives me a, you know, I used to just espouse the, um, the benefits of what we were doing and it was like, oh, it's really cool and like, check it out. But now it's like, it's cool to have a product uh, to, to, to drive protocol usage. So, yeah. Yeah, and now it's. I mean, now there's there's got to be a strong case for actual growth within the user base and the amount of transactions per day. I know that I've actually used Loopring before, and I actually just checked a few hours ago, and you guys had listed a bunch of new assets on there because for a while there, it was only about like what, like seven or eight coins or something like that. Yeah, true. Um, yeah, maybe I'm not even aware. It'll tell me everything. No, but it's um, it's yeah. We, we list we're listing coins with um, increasing frequency. But the gas, as, as Rob alluded to, like gas is going crazy. We represent this like safe harbor where you could transact gas free, right? Because a zk rollup is this layer two environment where you could transact and like update that state of the world, which only periodically gets proven and submitted to Ethereum. So. Definitely like a hot topic now because it's actually scary. I find the gas prices like it's not just like unfortunate. It's like literally scary about how clogged it could become. So we're definitely good. A problem is though is to get onto the, the ZK rollup in this current version is decently expensive. It's two hundred seventy five thousand gas to to create an account to like kind of map your Ethereum address to that world. And then another hundred thousand to deposit assets, and then then you're up and running. You're there with your assets, and you're gas free. But it's a dissuading factor to somebody just to get on there. They're looking at like sixty bucks right now, which is annoying. It's really it's it's really unfortunate. Luckily, our upcoming version, version three point six in November, um, which we just released, some reduced the onboarding cost. So I won't have to feel you know, silly when I tell somebody to come on loop ring and it, they're faced with like a, a charge, it'll be reduced by like, it'll be reduced to under 5,000 gas versus 275,000 gas. So, I mean, we're about like 5,000 users or just uh, under, um, cause you could see on chain every user that enters the roll up that registers, it's like 4,800. And so that's good, you know, for our still relatively small DeFi world or 
But yeah, we have in our sites, uh, especially for like the performance that we could offer to people, the, the type of experience, centralized exchanges, right? When you go into Loopring, it feels like a, it feels like you're on Binance or Yeah, whatever. for sure. It's not like a Uniswap or anything like that. But it, it kind of has a nicer feel though, because one thing about like the Uniswaps and, and the one inches and whatnot is you don't get that real trading feel that order, you know, type of thing. It's just more just like you're just pressing buttons, which is cool in its own sense, but you know, it doesn't bring the, the whole feel of being a trade. Right. That's true. Yeah, exactly. It's uh, important to specify. We are right now an order book based exchange, an order book layer two exchange. Yeah. Uniswap is, of course, a layer one AMM, but it's really cool. I don't want to like go all over the place that we'll be able to support AMM, automatic market makers, uh, that model on the ZK roll up in the upcoming version, which is like a really big deal, to be honest, because everyone loves AMMs because it's easy to kind of spin up liquidity, right? People could just passively deposit funds and then you have a, a, a liquid pool versus on an order book, we need like active people or really trading, yeah. Robots, right? We need their yeah. bots to, to be moving the, the market. So that's a harder sell. It's just harder to, in the long run, we think order books will still rule the world as they do in the normal legacy finance for, for, for several reasons. But it's really attractive, especially like for me, again, just a bootstrap growth to have AMMs where we could be like, oh, you want this pair? Deposit it here. And now there's a liquid pool, right? Just like the beauty of, of Uniswap, except no gas on, uh, on the Z. So that's really exciting. Well, and when a user places an order, like you might be on that, that fancy order book you like, it might be filling you with the best ask from the order book and a pool on layer two that is also kind of like better than the next ask so it'll you'll be uh, filled you can be filled by both at once so really awesome that's a that's a pretty huge upgrade not only for like order routing in these trades and, and providing more liquidity but also being able to connect to the automated market makers like you're saying and you meant actually andy mentioned that uh loopring just listed a whole bunch you know more assets what is the process like that because i have seen some different setups where decentralized protocols allow anyone to list any asset, right? That That's kind of the Uniswap model. You just throw in a smart contract address. So how does supporting Uniswap and those assets change that? You know, what is the listing process like? So just to be clear, it, like when we support AMMs, it's not like we're going to port all of uh, Uniswap onto there. Sushi coin! <laughs> right. Uh, it's just like now we can support AMM. So it's not right to say like Uniswap in particular. In fact, that might not be the style of curves we support. This kind of gets, this is even hazy to me. I don't know the full design yet, but like we might support, let's say, ba uh, balancer style pools. So then anybody could create a balancer style pool, like using their formula, but it's not actually pulling from layer one. But anyways, uh, your, your point definitely stands. That's a huge thing about listing. Uh, Uniswap, for all the reasons we just said, you could just, you deposit 50-50 of, of an asset in ETH or now any ERC to any ERC, and there you have your market. We cannot do that because a ZK rollup lives, like the whole beauty, how we scale is by doing everything off chain, just in a verifiable manner that you don't have to trust us, right? Like Binance is also an off chain solution, right? You send them your money and then you do everything there and you hope they don't run away or that they don't get hacked. We do the same thing except we can't run away or we could just not with your funds. Your funds are in an Ethereum smart contract that are mapped, uh, you know, that are mapped in a, in a very nice way to an off chain environment. And that link cannot be broken. Right. So I've heard a lot of comparisons to the lightning network in that way, right? Your, your funds live in this certain channel, but you still have access to them. And I think that's becoming a, a much more familiar concept with DeFi. Your tokens can live in a smart contract. And that smart contract is going to uphold the regulations, the guidelines that you set for it, right? So could you you kind of explain maybe how ZK rollups are you know similar or different from the Lightning Network, and then kind of how that evolved from Plasma? Because I, I still have seen Plasma as a type of scaling solution. Um, I know Loopring you know has ZK rollups, but uh, maybe if you could also explain that you know why Loopring went with ZK rather than the Plasma technology. Yeah, sure. Okay. And remind me, we'll get back to the listing question after because I didn't really answer it, but I think a prerequisite knowledge of ZK rollups is, is helpful to understand. Like, yeah, that, that's definitely Loopring's differentiator, right? Is the ZK technology. What ZK rollups do before we get into the differences is, yeah, a user deposits funds into a smart contract and that smart contract then maps their address 
to an off-chain world. That off-chain world lives in a database or a data structure, a Merkle tree, which we've probably all heard about. It's just, you know, some very useful data <laughs> database with, you know, you have one kind of summary root at the top and then little leaves and it looks like a Christmas tree. Except the root is at the top here. It's, we'll come back to that in, in, a, in a second, just because we'll talk about what that root means. But so, yeah, your funds are, so I always say this, like, so Rob, you know, Rob.eth. And again, I don't know if that's him, everybody, just for privacy reasons, don't send Rob. Oh, he's a millionaire. <laughs> yeah. um, like you're up, like you'll, well, now you have to, you have to, uh, it's hard to, I don't want to talk so much about like the 3.1 way because 3.6 is going to so much improve this, but let's just say like some of these things get better and cheaper and easier. But smart contract, like I want to go to that layer bring me there. So rob.eth becomes Merkle slot ID uh, 1006, or if you did it today, it'd be 4,805. That would be like your little market, your user ID is just in like your little, little, and then you're like, okay, great. You have your little house there and then you want to deposit assets. So you deposit one ETH and a hundred die from your address into the layer one smart contract. And then our ZK rollup, like this intermediary, this uh, this operator or relayer, who is, yeah, we'll, we'll get back to that. But he updates your your system. He says, "Oh, I got a deposit on chain. Now let me kind of update this off chain balance for just like how Binance does it. There's no real difference yet, right? Um, but the point is that like your money is in a smart contract. Nobody could access it there. To like only you, Rob Dadith, could withdraw." that balance, you in that pool. So like the loop ring deposit smart contract, all the funds live there and they're mapped to their respective owners in the layer two environment. Um, and right now there's like, let's say there's $20 million in, um, I have to make a tweet later that we passed the 20 million mark, remind me. Um, <laughs> there's $20 million in the loop ring deposit contract. You have a piece of it and it's displayed in your off chain balance. Then you are gonna now do your thing there. You're gonna, you know, send Andy, one die for fun, assuming he's on the ZK rollup right now to send Andy.eth, he, he'd have to be pre-registered on loop ring. He would have to come on himself uh, and then you could send him one die for free. So no gas, nothing, just it's going from your branch to his branch, right? You're not touching layer one. Um, and you could be trade, transfer. We are a DEX, but just to be clear, we also kind of in June expanded to offer just payments, simple transfers. So not just trading, but once you're on the ZK rollup, there's no reason why you can't just transfer money around, right? Instead of just trading. So now we support that. So it's also for payments. We don't just, Loopring is now a ZK rollup exchange and payment protocol. Uh, we've kind of expanded our identity. Anyway, so there you are, you're interacting in this off chain world periodically. And how ZK rollup scales is the operator says, okay, 4,000 things have happened in this off chain world. Let's go re like reconcile it to layer one. Right, like we filled up a batch. We're taking all these transactions. So it's Rob's send to Andy, Andy's trade versus Sarah, whatever. All these things. We're filling up a bus or an airplane, and we're saying everybody get on board. And then we like really compress it. There's a zk roll up, like a, the zk stands for zero knowledge, but it it's not for any privacy reason. Uh, people associate zk to, to, to the privacy either because it's zcash probably because of yeah Z -cash. exactly because zcash right. who are pioneers and made much of the work that we use uh to be clear zk is just like a branch of cryptography that predated zcash right it's just like zero knowledge cryptography that they really just made amazing for crypto purposes but um so we use it though it, it should be called a validity proof roll up we use a zero knowledge proof just because it's a sort of validity proof let's say we take these four thousand things compress them well first of all like we execute them like andy's send to sarah it's executed in our state we we aggregate four thousand things we compress them and we have a proof a validity proof that says everything that happened in this state of the world corresponded to the rules of the protocol which are like here like any other like anybody could see the rules right like that is loop ring it's just a bunch of rules the fact that we compress a bunch of stuff and have like a spit out thumbprint of everything's veracity means Okay, that's great. Everything that happened there is true. Then we put this, this thumbprint, this validity proof on chain back to Ethereum to a verifier contract, which simply says, hmm, okay, great. As soon as the, ver the contract sees it, that means that it's true. Everything that happened 
erect by construction. You cannot falsify or forge this proof. So when you put this proof on chain, you are saying to Ethereum, okay, this is the new state of the Merkle tree. After all these 4,000 things happened to it, carry on. So what we did there is we took computation, instead of doing it on layer one, like, you know, like Uniswap is doing now and everybody else, all these computations bringing up gas, we do it off chain in a verifiably correct way, aggregate it, put it on chain. So that's how, uh, yeah, I'm not sure where I ended up there, but that's how a Z but, well, first of all, should I stop there or should I continue with some of the differences versus Plasma and Optimistic? What do you guys think? I think that, I think that, that would help bridge the context, right? Because it, it makes sense that, you know, right now, I, as I understand rollups, they roll up the transaction. It's essentially a batching process, right? But that, I believe, is a very similar to like a broker model where, you know, they have everything in their order book and then they have some sort of recon at the end of the day. It, it, it sounds, you know, really similar. Could you explain like the differences, yeah, between plasma, optimistic, and then ultimately, you know, does that scale down fees just because you're sending less transactions on chain, or is there something else that helps uh, minimize the fees and remain decentralized and trustless? Right. So I'll answer the latter part first. It's it's scaling by virtue of that aggregation of that rolling up. Okay. As you say. So we take four thousand things and we have an overhead cost. When the relayer takes a batch, compresses it, and puts the proof on chain, it's let's call it 350,000 gas. It, that's the cost. It's fixed. It's like jet fuel, right? Like the airplane. It wants the plane to be full, so it amortized its cost over more heads. That is how we scale. Like so, for your trade, we are, and you don't care about these 500 dollars gas fees that are happening on chain. But then when we go to chain and we land on Ethereum. With our plane, we have to pay that overhead cost, that fixed cost, largely fixed, asterisk, I'll get back to that. But that's how we, we scale. We have an overhead cost amortized over 4,000 together type thing. That's how you're getting, like buying a group pass, right? And that's that's how we are, that's how roll-ups thing scales uh, almost on, on layer two. So now the difference is the ZK roll-up on the spectrum of, of, of layer two scaling, ZK roll-ups is like right at the right end in, in my mind or which way you're looking at me, the most secure side on the spectrum of like kind of sc scale or like, yeah, how fast you could go or how much more scale you could do, how much more TPS transaction per second versus like security that you're giving up. ZK rollups make no sacrifices for Ethereum level security. They want to stay, that's what we like to call it like layer 1.5. It's like so tightly coupled to Ethereum. And that is because every state transition of the off-chain world is being proven with a validity proof. That is, so whenever you see like, so ZK rollups, the big thing is that it has a validity proof. The state is transitioning and it is correct at that moment. You, it was impossible that the relayer took too much money from Andy to rob or did something because when it's going in this black box to make the, the ZK snark proof, when the snark is created, it means everything that happened followed the rules, okay? That is, so let, let's call it the validity proof model. Really, ZK is a misnomer. The validity proof model. Things are valid at the start. And then it puts it on chain. Optimistic rollups are, re so, so it takes validity proof and it puts it on chain. And there's no questions asked. Optimistic rollups are optimistic. It's a pretty good name, actually. They say, let's not like do this like crazy math to make a proof that this compressed batch is correct. Let me just submit the batch like the updated Merkle root, which represents the entire state. And you know, if somebody doesn't believe me, challenge me. Um, let's do, so that's called like a fraud proof system. That's why validity proof is a better name because it juxtaposes it versus fraud proof. You know, so an optimistic role is optimistic. Here's the new state of the world. Here's the new Merkle tree. If you don't believe me, then challenge me. Uh, show me how I'm wrong. Show me that I tried to steal money or that the operator tried to steal money. And if you're right with your challenge, you're going to like win some of my money. I have something on the line, right? Like a, 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 a bond, uh, an economic security guarantee. So, so that's it. With So, I mean, there's tons of differences that sprout out of that, but that's the big difference. One is more strict. You're making a validity proof before you submit. The other one is you're submitting and then fraud proofs could challenge you if you're wrong. So if right there you conceptually see that you might want to trust like cryptography better to be like correct by design versus maybe somebody cheated. Although if your economic incentives are properly 
constructed, you should, and I'm, you know, optimistic rollups are going to be amazing for other reasons. They're not live yet, but you, you know, they should be secure, but there's certain other properties. Like let's say a ZK rollup, when I submit that proof on chain, it's final, right? It was already proven to be correct. So all of the resultant changes from that batch could be in effect and people could withdraw their money. Like when Andy sent Rob one, one die, so now he has one less die. As soon as the, that batch proof is submitted, Andy could, you know, leave. He goes back to, he deposits out of the contract. With optimistic rollups, because there's a challenge period to find fraud, you cannot leave right away. When a new state of the world is put there, you can't just be like, okay, I'm out. Um, you got to be like, all right, let's give people time to find fraud or, you know, make sure. So that's a big thing is like these withdrawal periods could be, could be long in an optimistic, uh, in a fraud proof model. Um, and by the way, what I, so what I just said in the optimistic sense, all of that basically translates to plasma. Let's just go right into it. The difference, the difference there is that in both roll-up designs, what makes a roll-up a roll-up, either a validity proof roll-up, ZK roll-up, or the optimistic roll-up model is besides submitting just the Merkle proof, uh, the Merkle root, uh, the, the summary of, of everything, like be, besides submitting that plus the proof, a roll-up also submits kind of like this interim data. Specifically, it's the deltas of all the little leaves of the Merkle tree, it is putting that on chain as well. So it has like an extra load. So actually this is a good analogy I never thought of. Really, you have the plane, you also have like extra baggage down below. So you have, you need even more fuel to get to your destination. Cause like you have a couple suitcases underneath that, that, that we are writing to Ethereum call data. Okay, that's what a ZK, that's what a ZK roll and an optimistic roll, but it has extra data. What that extra data does per batch is it, it's a cookie trail or a cookie come trail. It, it allows people to, at any point in time, say, okay, if I want to reconstruct the state of the world as it was yesterday or last month or one second ago, I have all of the deltas of the state transitions since the beginning of time. So I could literally start from zero day to the Merkle tree, the state of the world as it stood yesterday or just before. Because So that is the big thing. Roll-ups do everything we just said, but they have a bit of extra baggage. That baggage is the data availability problem. Like, I don't mean to make, it's huge. Like, it is the thing that, like, that's why we all love roll-ups. It's because the data is there. Anybody else could reconstruct the state of the world. Because in the, what are we trying to prevent here, right? In a bad case scenario, if loop ring turns malicious or leaves or gets an accident happen regularly, like, right, you want to be sure that you could get your funds from that deposit contract because all of those little cookie crumbs could let you recreate the state of the world as it was five minutes ago, you're fine with loop ring being obliterated. You don't care um, because the, the roll up provided you, the, the roll up puts data on Ethereum. So if Ethereum exists, then you can withdraw your funds. In a plasma, it's basically what we described with the optimistic way, but they're not putting data on chain. They're, they're not putting that data on chain. There has to be like the kind of validators or like players involved that stay up to keep that data available. So if somebody says, hey, I want my money from, like I know we're in the middle of a new block or a new kind of commitment that's gonna come to chain, but I want my money from like yesterday or like the, the state of the world as it was, you cannot reconstruct that yourself. You are, reliant on this plasma operator or this plasma operators for that data. You have to say, hey, I want that data so I could recreate the puzzle myself. That is the big difference. And let's just extend it one little bit more. You could have a validity proof plasma. That is what Starkware has done with Diversify. Um, so Starkware is, you know, it was like, Starkware is not by default a ZK roll. They could do they allow both, but they were a validium. First and foremost, validium is another word for validity proof plasma. Uh, it's a new word, right? It's like only a few months ago, I think like Vitalik kind of coined it when all this was coming to a head. But so validity proof, you still, you still 
validate each commitment with a validity proof, but you don't have that extra baggage. So you're happy when, so, so the, the validity proof updates the state and it was correct by construction, but if you want your data, you cannot just rely on Ethereum because Plasma means it's held by other people, not the chain. Um, that's, that's the definition of non-rollup uh, Plasma, if you, is that the data is not on Ethereum. Okay. All right, that, that was a, a lot of info that you dumped on us, but I, I think I could kind of narrow it down into this challenger model, which is more that optimistic model versus the roll-up model, which is the validity model, right? And, it, and just like you said, Starkware or Validium is the continuation or the le- next logical step because it combines both. And, and that's kind of as you described it, where my mind was going. Like you could take each of these validity models where they're sending data on chain and then you could add a challenger model if you wanted to increase security or maybe you could start with the challenger model and then add the roll-up model onto that right right so really good understanding one little snag and probably my fault um so the the two axes here are validity proof and fraud proof like or the the choice set is validity proof or fraud proof and data on chain or off-chain. Those are the four quadrants. Um, So a roll-up just means the data is, uh, uh, there's this helpful diagram, but so a roll-up could either be challenger model or validity model. A plasma could either be a challenger model or a validity model. That's what Validium is. So Validium isn't not necessarily um, a a logical next step. It is just a trade-off. The reason why Validium is attractive for some people is it's more scalable because you don't have that extra baggage. It's not a roll up, right? I'll only use the word roll up now if it's a roll up. Validium is a, is, a, is a validity proof plasma. So the validity proof is there, but the data is not. So you don't have the guarantee in the worst case scenario that you could extract your funds like you could in a ZK roll up. You like, let's talk specifics here. Like in the Starkware model, like with, with Diversify specifically, they're more, they're more scalable than us because they have less baggage to commit the chain. They are not a roll-up, but they are committing everything with an associated validity proof. But in the worst case, you have to kind of ask this data availability committee, this like circle of notaries, data guarantors, or however you want to call it, that says, hey, shit just went wrong. I need my money back from the last state of the world. One of them needs to say, ah, this is the data you're looking for. Some people are okay with that, that one of N data guarantors of like respected companies, right? Starkware, Diversify, they will provide you that data. But what if, what if, what if they all, you know, whatever, right? Not them specifically, they're awesome. But that model, right? Like the point is, do you have to rely on just Ethereum or Ethereum plus something else? That is something in Plasma, the data is not on chain, you have to rely on somebody else in the worst case scenarios. Right. The ZK rollup model is nearly as secure as Ethereum and just, you know, a tad faster in terms of the TPS. I'm sure there is an exact number there. And then the uh, the optimistic is a little less secure on the end of the spectrum, but also faster. Is that correct? Yeah. Again, really good. One slight hitch is, sorry, I'm getting a lot of pings here. But yeah, so ZK rollup is the most secure. I'm comfortable. Oh, it is the most secure. No, yeah, so ZK rollup, you said that correctly. It is the most secure. I'm comfortable saying it's as secure as Ethereum. Some people could poke holes and say, oh, you had a trusted setup, right? That's a whole other story. But what if that was corrupted? But assuming you let you understand you're fine with the cryptography, ZK rollups are as secure as Ethereum for asset custody. Loopring could leave, turn malicious. Your assets will always be safe and only retrievable by you. Optimistic rollups, the trade-off is you don't have the state transition being valid at that moment, which, as we said, can mean that withdrawals are slow. The huge, huge benefit, though, are they're more flexible. You will be able to recreate that Ethereum beautiful composability and generalizability in optimistic rollups oh, better than UK rollups. So optimistic rollups could be composable with other L2 solutions as well within one protocol per se. Whereas like, say if, if Loopring was trying to use ZK ropes to integrate with three other protocols on L2, it would be a little more difficult. 
a little more difficult. That's right. Okay. It's Makes sense. It's becoming increasingly possible. Yeah, I see. I don't know exactly how, but yeah, um, it's like, it's much easier to, like, yeah, not only will optimistic rollups allow, let's say something like synthetics or compound to be there itself. But right. it'll, it'll be able to be more composable itself. It's yeah, and that I mean that that makes sense when you have like the fully decentralized route, which in my mind is kind of what the zk rollup idea is. It's like this. It's proven by cryptography. It, it's obviously going to be a bit. There's going to be some pros and, and cons versus when you have the optimistic route, which kind of has an arbitrator idea inside of it. So that kind of brings that ability of composability, but also that also has pros and cons. So it's just kind of what you want to build on, I, I suppose, and like what you're trying to get done within a certain, you know, time frame or, or roadmap. About trade-offs, no one is better than the other. Our, my favorite is ZK rollups uh, for obvious reasons. Um, but yeah, ZK rollups right now are really good for transfers, like just simple payments, right? Yeah. And for trades, order book trading, like we've been doing that for six months. So that we cannot do fancier stuff except we announced the other day that we'll be able to do AMMs. But yeah, it's a great way you, you put it, Andy. ZK, because you have this like black box of like proving a, a snark, it's like more restrictive. It's like tighter. Yeah. You can't compose general logic in there just yet. Starkware is doing great work on that. Uh, Matter Labs is doing great work on that. Like these are our peers, competitors. They're, it's kind of, they're, we'll, like, this is my view. ZK rollups are the only thing, the only rollups that's live right now. It's us, it's, um, it's diversified ZK sync. Um, optimistic rollups are going to come and kind of like leapfrog it maybe in terms of notoriety or whatever, because you'll be able to do other more fancy things on there. But then ZK rollups with advances in cryptography will be able to do all that stuff in a validity proof way. Um, it, it just, we need that, like those constraints to relax a bit. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let's, let's, let's throw it way back. Uh, I think we're getting a little technical here I, at this point. If you're still listening to this and you're watching, I applaud you huge. I, I think you, you just learned something that most people don't have any idea on, on crypto Twitter, hell, let alone even on 4chan or Reddit. So congrats to you, but I'm still really interested on kind of what your guys, the, the process of listing assets is and kind of what, if there's a community vote to that, if, if the, if there's if there's governance there or if it's all just kind of like you know like like how does that work or yeah what's the process there because everything is happening in this layer two zk rollup environment that environment doesn't know what the hell you know is lrc is our token or any token it, it doesn't even really know eth for that matter we have to kind of say maybe a, my, by the way i might be butchering this right these are all my conceptions of this no like, yeah this exactly is like, probably but like we have to say hey in this world like this this id of like this piece of data corresponds to eth this one like data bit two like token id two is lrc three is usdt so just there you see it's harder for us to list things like sure we could mass list every token right now and say okay this is all their corresponding mappings but first of all in the current version we only have 256 slots for tokens um, we could fit 1 million users on the rollup and 256 tokens for reasons, okay? In the upcoming version, we will be able to have a bill. Uh, I'm not sure actually the, the user number. Is it a, a billion users? Yeah, I think a billion users and 65,000 token slots. So we could list all, all the tokens. Like, so, but you see right there, it's a manual. Yeah. There's a manual thing. Like there's a manual thing. So that's like registering it at the ZK rollup level. Then for loop ring, remember, we have this monolithic operator that is making sure that this state of the world gets wrapped up and then put here. That operator is a human or a set of humans running an instance on AWS. Again, this doesn't make it insecure. Everything is validity proven when everything is being changed, in, but changed, but it doesn't change the fact that here's this person running a software. It's a matching engine. It's an order book. It's a matching engine. So it has to be registered in the rollup and then registered on the relayer saying, okay, I am making this trading pair, UMA versus U UMA versus ETH. I am making that. You, it's like a normal thing, right? Like why doesn't Binance have every single trading pair right now? It's because they have to like do it on their back end, right? They have yeah. to like list the pair and then open it. Like it's the same for us. We have to say, okay, like it's that simple. I won't go in for yeah. I guess kind of what I mean. I appreciate like the understanding on on how it works, but I guess more of what I was trying to get at is kind of what is like the process on choosing. 
the tokens, if you will. That, that's fair. I'm so sorry in that. No, no, no. Because, I mean, that does make sense. Um, but yeah, yeah it, it informs this answer. So, yeah, we have a token listing form and we say, hey, what do you want to list and, and why? And we're like right now, there's no LRC voting. LRC will take on a bunch of new properties. That that might be something we want to talk about in a bit. Maybe. Yeah, for sure. LRC. But right now we just choose. We say, OK, what what is this token? First, we see if it matches. We can only support ERC-20s. If it's like something else right now, or if it's like ERC-20 with some funky function that's like deflationary, we can't support it. So is it technically feasible? And like, do we think it'll do well, right? Like maybe this is a partner of ours that says, hey, we really want to get this up there. And even if it's not the most popular token in the world, we'll say, sure, you know, you're our friend. So it's a completely centralized thing. As you see here, I'm not afraid to say. We'll be like, okay, this, you know, the other day we listed Wi-Fi, right? We listed Wi-Fi and Curve. Um, because I was like, all right, let's do this. So, so we listed them, right? And uh, so, so, so that's it. It's we choose. We choose based on a technical little, a small little requirement, and then what do we have time? Right. It also takes a bit of time to do it. So we have a huge backlog of listing requests. But like, a, it takes a bit of time to set them up. B, for that same order book reason that we spoke about at the beginning, once we list them, it's not liquid on minute one, right? It's just an empty order book. It's quite ugly. So we have to say, okay, people start padding the books, start putting asks and offer and asks and bids. So that's another thing. That's just a very social thing. It's kind of embarrassing when we lit, like I listed, we listed both Wifey and Curb with no like concerted effort with like our own market making tool or with a third party market maker that said, okay, before we announce, we're going to have like a liquid book. That's something like Coinbase would never do, right? They like have like a day of people just like putting in orders before it opens up to the public. Uh, you know, we're more casual. We're like, all right, here's the pair. Let's see what happens. I listed it. And you know, it was a slow start, but three days later, people started populating the order books. So uh, really cool, right? Like, um, but yeah, it's not that Uniswap level of just passively deposit assets and now everybody has a has a market. It has to, it takes time. Yeah, I mean, that's awesome. I mean, I, I know that if I'm trading Wi-Fi or Curve and I'm and Gwei is anywhere near 400, I'm coming to, to Loop Ring to make the trade. There's like, there's no, there's no questions asked. You know what I'm saying? Thank you. Yeah, for sure. And it makes sense just to have like capital, you know, allocated to loop ring, just sitting there when something like that happens, right? Because if gas is really, really high, you're not going to want to execute or fill a trade on any other exchange. So um, I, I'm interested, especially when this 3.6 upgrade comes out so that I can get some passive yield while holding capital there and the lower gas fees. I mean, that it. You know, there, there are certain things that I guess DeFi traders or investors are looking for, and that seems to hit on every single checkpoint. So yeah, um, I, I I definitely think there's some marketing that could be done in terms of Loopring is the exchange not just for the whales to dominate DeFi. We're we're here for the minnows too. You know, <laughs> that's very true. Uh, that's a really good point. You're you're both hired, <laughs> but actually, I like to, I like to say like who is Loopring good for? Like who would use it right now? It's really for like professional sophisticated traders who want to like take their coinbase bot right that's like or whatever right like so high frequency because by the way back to your your point before andy we can do 2000 transactions per second 2000, yeah honestly it's quite, yeah like it's quite high right that's like that's like a thousand x or 700 x depending on how you look at it versus our last version so like huge scalability corresponding basically decrease in cost but yeah so sophisticated traders could place an order, cancel an order, you know, five times a second, do their sophisticated thing that they need that low latency guarantee for. And on the other end, it could be like the big like retail, right? That right now cannot do a trade for $5 without losing a hundred. Um, they could place a trade. So it's a nice mix. You have yeah. sophisticated traders and you have retail traders. That is what you want for a market. That's what we could support. And Matt, correct me if I'm wrong, but it loopering would scale as more traders are, are using it, right? And that's very, very different from like a traditional legacy market model where they just want the most assets under management, right? They just wanna get interest on their bank account, holding all of that money, and they're not really worried about the minnow, as Andy put it. But, you know, Loopring is looking for as many minnows as possible. They don't really care how much, or you don't, you know, really care how much money they're moving at once. Uh, it actually helps scalability as more users flock to it. 
That's very true. I mean, ultimately we want the most assets on there because we want more trades to happen because we'll take, we'll take a fee on that. And just in general, we could do more with more assets, but it's very true. We just want actually more user activity right now. We will get faster with more users, not slower because right. of the airplane thing, right? When, when there's 12 people on the airplane, we kind of, we literally say like, oh, let's wait a bit longer so we can get 20 people before we pay the hundred dollars in fee overhead right so more but that that's up to a point we like right now our plane is hardly ever full right it's not like there's a million friends that when we hit like our biggest airplane size our biggest batch size is 4096 so for the near term more users more activity equals faster for everybody then we'll hit right. that plateau of the batch and then it'll that won't be true anymore but yeah yeah okay so yeah, but think, you go ahead I, I was just going to ask one more, or I, I guess just segue into Loopring's model, but it, it sounds like right now Loopring is scaling faster than demand, which is going to be important, right, to to just keep up with demand and all the new users. I, I'm interested about kind of Loopring the coin, and yeah, I know you had a question, so you can, you know, take it away. Yeah, that's exactly where I was going. I was going to say we uh, are about out of time here, but I would definitely want to touch on the Loopring token. The one thing that I'm interested in is, well, I guess two things is first is the governance. So what's that going to look like for the token holders or the stakers? You know, if there's going to be any, what, you know, if there's progress, what the roadmap is on that. So if you want to touch on that and then after that, definitely interested and in, those probably go pretty close hand in hand uh, as to how the loop ring token accrues value through the exchange. So what tangible elements of, of, of interaction and and tokenomics uh, can lead to the valuation of loop ring token. Okay, great. Yeah, I'll basically just, I guess, combine those questions. They're similar enough in my mind, but yeah. So the LRC token right now is a staking token for two use cases, really. Users, like any old person that never has used even our exchange, right? Because this is still on layer one, could just stake LRC and they get a, a percentage of the protocol fee. The protocol fee is six basis points of any trade that happens on the Loopring protocol, right? So Loopring.io is just one instance of a Loopring application on the protocol. So any trade that happens on Loopring.io, six basis points goes into a fee vault. That fee vault is claimable by LRC stakers. So that's simple enough. Um, yeah, by the way, there's like another, there's another Loopring based exchange in, in, in China um, called Weedex their fees also, so it's protocol level fees, right? Six basis points. Um, six basis points is rather arbitrary. We came up with that like at instance. And what does that mean real quick? What is six basis points? So six basis points is six hundredths of a percent. So 0.06%. Okay. So yeah. like, so Understood. yeah, yeah. Six hundredths of a percent. So like not a 10th of a percent, but slightly less. Um, um, yeah, so, so that's that. To, to skip to the governance for a second, right now, LRC does not have governance properties, but it could have for things exactly like that. What should the protocol fee be? Maybe we want it to be eight basis points, you know, eight hundredths of a percent or 20 uh, basis points. So LRC could configure things like that. But on the other, so, so that's it. It's a staking token to earn rewards. It's also stakeable or must be staked by debt, the applications themselves. Loopring.io, the operator, us, has to stake, like the DEX, let's call it, has to stake a big chunk of LRC for like a kind of service level guarantee. Even though as we've just described, there's no risk that your funds will be taken, right? As long as Ethereum exists. But there is a risk in terms of like a relay or like the person doing this being like kind of annoying and they could be slow or like reject some transactions. So there's ways that by the LR, by the exchange operator staking something, let's call it 500,000 LRC is the number right now, if they misbehave, like if they're too slow to submit a sequential block or if they do some type of reversion, they'll get slashed. So there is a slashing mechanism, not for that base layer security that we sleep at night with, that's Ethereum, but for that like service level guarantee that I'm not gonna be like annoyed by my specific application, LRC is staked. So, so that's it. Um, to be frank, though, our model is outdated for where we are. It's like over a year old. We've come a long way in the past year. We now have payments in the system, like on the ZK roll-up, so Loopring, uh, LRC could be used somewhere else. We haven't yeah. had governance in it yet. 
So I'd say like everything I just said is like largely ha- how we're going to continue to think about it, but it's very safe to say the mechanics are going to be changed, obviously, hopefully for the better. But um, yeah, I don't want to like make any promises here, but there's so much we could do to make it better and hopefully even do everything on layer two. It's like not staking. Like right now you have to stake LRC on layer one. How annoying is that, right? You're going to pay 10 bucks in gas fees. Uh, imagine doing it on layer two or it's just being normal. Like you holding loop ring, you holding LRC on the loop ring ZK rollup should be equivalent to staking. That's my dream. So um, yeah, yeah. And and how is that going to change maybe with 3.6? Because you know right now the fees get locked in a vault and then that's claimable by all the LRC holders. Is that going to look like a you know, a weird combination now that people are, can provide liquidity in pools and they get a portion of that same fee vault? Yeah, no, really good point. I mean, it's undefined how we will do this. We're thinking about it heavily, but it's kind of like 3.6 deploys and then we could do all this other stuff. 3.6 is just mm. so important to get the usability up, reduce cost, reduce wait times, increase everything. Then we'll be able to play around with the LRC mechanics. But exactly what you said, like it should be just so simple. Holding LRC on layer two is staking. That gives you your your claim on the fee vault, which, which will have to be like migrated to layer two or some like whatever. I'm, I'm rough around the edges, but it should be exactly like that. It should just be simple. Yeah. Awesome. Well, that was absolutely awesome, Matt. We definitely appreciate your time and we we learned a lot. And I know those who are listening most definitely have. Yeah, man, that was awesome. Go loop ring. That was great. Yeah, I I know I learned a lot. Thanks for coming on, man. No, thank you guys. You asked great questions. I think you have a good uh, understanding of it. And um, yeah, thank you, DeFi Slate. I'll see you on the ZK roll-up, either this version or next. (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) For sure. For sure. Thanks for listening to the DeFi by Design podcast. Until next time, DeFi Slate team.